To be honest, good horror is all about bringing your audience to experience a certain fear that they wouldn't normally care about or even think of. And that's potentially why Alien has become what it is and why it's so effective with fans. I mean, men and women had never previously imagined that a human could suffer a forced oral intercourse by some alien creature and get pregnant, at least in a manner of speaking. Well, the dementedly intelligent mind of H.R. Giger managed to imagine something of the sort, and the franchise was born in all its horrifying glory. In this video, we'll explore the alien creatures that made it possible, the facehuggers, the second stage of a xenomorph's life cycle, and the swift minions of a fate worse than death. Let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. <laughs> H.R. Giger's original facehugger Alien was written by Dan O'Bannon, and of course he had some initial ideas about how he wanted facehuggers to look like. So he sent a letter to Mr. Giger and asked him to create a design of a creature that would look like an octopus and have tentacles, which it would use to wrap around its victim's head after leaping onto the victim from a distance. Furthermore, the organism was to have an ovipositor, which it would use to shove down the victim's unfortunate throat. To make Giger understand better, Dan O'Bannon also attached a sketch of the creature he had in mind. But later, Giger humorously revealed that the sketch looked like that of a flying omelette, and I couldn't agree more. Now, you should know that Mr. Giger was basically a skilled industrial designer before he became the legendary creature artist and Oscar winner. Anyway, as an industrial designer, he always tried to ensure that everything in a design must have a particular function, and each of the parts of the creature should have a clearly defined function, something that his viewers wouldn't have to scratch their heads to understand. From Dan O'Bannon's letter and the flying omelette sket, Giger assumed that his creature was to hatch out of a large egg, and this hatching would not be as delicate as seen in birds. It would be violent. And the creature would jump out using its tail, much like the spring in a jack-in-the-box. So Giger started his design with the body of the creature, which greatly resembled a giant, albeit distorted phallus. Instead of the long tentacles that Dan O'Bannon had spoken about, Giger gave this guy spidery fingers, which was pretty novel a thought. Some thought Giger got this inspiration from the Marvel comic the Eternals issue 6, in which the Eternal named Cersei transforms a gun's barrel into tentacles that are then made to wrap around the neck of a deviant. Additionally, Giger thought if the creature had to pry open its victim's mouth, the creature would need something like pliers. Well, Hollywood and the rest of the world hadn't yet learned the true master that Giger was. But look at us, talking about the man's creation even after four and a half decades. Regular facehugger. So by now you must have understood that facehuggers come out of eggs, as was envisioned in the early stages of the film's development. A xenomorph queen lays ovomorphs, or xenomorph eggs, that house the facehuggers. When an unsuspecting victim comes too close, the ovomorph reacts to the external stimulus and alerts the facehuggers, which erupt out of the eggs. And that's pretty much the end for most people. The facehugger launches itself toward the host with ferocious accuracy, aiming for the mouth. Once placed in the desired position, the facehugger hugger secures the grip using its tail as an ever-tightening rope around the neck of the host. Furthermore, it uses its eight long digits around the skull to hold the head firmly. Then, it administers into the host a cyanose-based chemical that paralyzes the host. The mode of this contact is presumably skin contact. And lastly, the alien also releases a neuromuscular toxin in the sedative, which acts quickly to induce a state of deep unconsciousness. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that the face hugger gives precise dosages of these enzymes and chemicals to the host depending on the host's body mass, which in turn ensures the victim's rapid sedation without fatal or adverse effects. Only after all of this has been done does the facehugger begin the complex and intricate process of implantation of the xenomorph embryo into the host. But here's the catch. What the facehugger delivers to the victim is not essentially an embryo, but another chemical. I'll come to that in a bit. For this part of the impregnation process, the facehugger uses its proboscis, which serves as a dual function. The facehugger doesn't want the victim to die of suffocation, so the proboscis also provides some oxygen and other atmospheric gases essential for the host's breathing and respiration. The next thing that the proboscis delivers is a mutagenic substance called the plagiaris prepotons, which goes straight down the host's esophagus, or similar organs in the alien creatures. This was the catch I was talking about. Contrary to previously accepted theories, the facehugger doesn't deliver an embryo into the host. The plagiaris prepotons mutates the internal organs 
organs of the host to create a xenomorph embryo. This cellular assembly process results in the development of the chest burster at a microscopic level within the host. The implantation process takes several hours, during which the mutagenic substance triggers a restructuring of the host cellular composition. Royal Facehugger The Royal Facehugger is also called the Queen Facehugger, or the Super Facehugger. Although a facehugger, it's a quite a distinct and special variant, and plays a very crucial role in the hive and the propagation of the species as a whole. As the name suggests, the Royal Facehugger leads to the creation of a royal chestburster, which ultimately grows up to become a xenomorph queen. However, probably the most distinct characteristic of a Royal Facehugger is its ability to impregnate two hosts before its eventual and inevitable demise. The first host usually receives the queen's embryo, and the second one receives a typical xenomorph, such as a drone, and the royal facehugger remains alive until both embryos have been successfully implanted. Now, for how long exactly can the royal facehugger stay alive after impregnating the first host and before impregnating the second is unknown, so let's just go with long enough. But why the two hosts? Well, the development of a queen chest burster into a full-fledged adult queen takes more time compared to a regular xenomorph, such as a drone, so the queen chestburster needs a bodyguard for protection. As far as the appearance of a royal facehugger is concerned, it's fairly larger than your typical facehugger and comes with additional offensive and defensive tools such as an armored body and a bladed tail. The digits of a royal facehugger are webbed and their coloring tends to be dark brown, although certain variations may exist. The only time we saw one of these guys was in Fiorina 161 or in Alien 3. In the special edition of the film, the royal facehugger attacks the ox and is shown for a mere few seconds, so we can't really say if it's canon or not, but yeah. NECA came up with a toy a few years back and the royal facehugger has appeared extensively in comics and even in games. Praetorian Facehugger The Praetorian Facehugger is another quite important facehugger and leads to the creation of Praetorian Xenomorphs. Its most notable appearance was on the planet LV-742. Among several means Praetorian formation observed in this world, the Praetorian Facehugger turned out to be the most convenient method to create Ravagers and Carriers, which were more or less exclusive to LV-742. Distinguished by its larger size and increased durability, the Praetorian Facehugger was menacing even to look at. The the creature came adorned with crimson chitinous armor that set it apart from its conventional counterparts, whose skin tone typically bear beige hues. Sporting a scorpion-like appearance, this variant had enhanced mobility, being capable of traveling greater distances from the hive without assistance, and leaping impressive distances compared to regular facehuggers. It would successfully subdue even formidable prey like yauchas with relative ease. Engineered Facehugger, aka Protomorph Facehugger. The Engineered Facehugger, commonly known as the Protomorph Facehugger, is a distinct variant of the Facehugger, found on Planet 4 or the Engineer homeworld where David, the android, committed the genocide. Unlike its counterparts, the Protomorph Facehugger exhibits notable differences in appearance and behavior. Physically, the Protomorph Facehugger maintains the familiar shape of other variants, but with distinct cosmetic features. Notably, the reddish wrinkled area between its forelegs, commonly seen in other facehuggers, is replaced by a smooth surface that matches the rest of its body's coloration. Its digits are longer and thinner, displaying four knuckles on each digit, a departure from the typical three-knuckled structure. Additionally, the parasite air sacs differ, giving it a bumpy and solid appearance compared to the smoother texture of its counterparts. Functionally, the protomorph facehugger exhibits remarkable speed and agility, surpassing other versions in these aspects. This is because it's not too strong with its grip on the host. Its swiftness renders it exceedingly difficult to shoot, even with automatic rifles. While capable of subduing an adult human, the protomorph facehugger can be removed from the host's face relatively easy, albeit with the use of a knife. In contrast, other facehuggers with their deadly acid blood would result in fatal consequences for the host upon such attempts. Remarkably, the acid blood of the Planet 4 variants appears to be slightly less potent, causing superficial damage compared to the extensive destruction caused by other facehuggers. This ability to swift implant the chestburster makes their capability to keep the host alive and in a coma somewhat redundant, which goes on to suggest that they may have evolved as a last resort to ensure successful impregnation when forced removal becomes imminent. So despite being engineered in the first place, the protomorph did undergo evolutionary changes.
Trilobite. The Trilobite, also known as the Body Hugger, was featured in Ridley Scott's film Prometheus. Despite its name, the enigmatic organism bears little resemblance to its prehistoric namesake, the Trilobite. Evolving from a mere drop of black goo, the Trilobite transforms into a formidable tentacle creature capable of taking down a nine-foot-tall engineer. In the film, the Trilobite's origins can be traced back to the expedition led by archaeologists Charlie Holloway and Elizabeth Shaw to the moon LV-223 on the spacecraft Prometheus. They stumble upon ancient intergalactic maps that resemble extinct human cultures, eventually leading them to a massive artificial structure containing mysterious objects, including steatite ampules filled with a highly unstable black liquid. During the expedition, David secretly infects Holloway with the black liquid, and unknowingly, Holloway passes it on to Shaw through sexual intercourse. Shaw later discovers that she is pregnant and experiences severe abdominal pain. Using a med pod, she performs a cesarean on herself, giving birth to what initially appears to be a small, squid-like creature, the trilobite. Shaw believes that the creature to be dead or unconscious and seals it in the med pod. Pod. However, to her surprise, the trilobite undergoes rapid growth within the med pod, similar to a xenomorph chestburster, and emerges as a massive squid-like organism. The adult trilobite exhibits distinct features, such as powerful and agile tentacles, used to subdue and immobilize its victims. Its main body boasts a large mouth with sharp teeth and a feeding tube, utilized for impregnation. The creature also possesses holes at its back, potentially for breathing or providing air to the host's mouth. After successfully impregnating an engineer, the trilobite died and the engineer fell unconscious, possibly due to exhaustion. The creature that the trilobite led to was a deacon instead of a xenomorph. Hey, baby. Oh, oh, ah. Hammerpede. The Hammerpede was a mental organism that was also featured in the film Prometheus. Encountered on LV-223 by the crew of the USCSS Prometheus, the Hammerpede is a result of the mutation of indigenous worms caused by exposure to chemical A03959X.91.15, which is commonly known as the black goo. We have extensively explored the black goo in other videos. If you wish to know more about this substance, how it affects organisms, who created it, and much more, I suggest you take a look at the link in the description. Coming back to the Hammerpede, as far as its physical appearance is concerned, the Hammerpede has pale, white-gray skin with a slightly translucent appearance, sharing some resemblance with the Neomorphs. Its serpent-like body can grow up to approximately four feet in length, with distinct crests around its mouth, which bears stark resemblance with the cobra hoods. The creature has impressive strength, as witnessed when Feifeld unsuccessfully attempts to remove one from a fellow crew Milburn forearm. One notable feature of the Hammerpede is its ability to regenerate severed body parts at a rapid pace, and it regenerates to its original form within seconds. Now, I know a Hammerpede isn't quite a facehugger, but it does enter Milburn's mouth to subdue him, and facehuggers force their proboscis down their victim's esophagus. White Hybrid Facehugger The White Hybrid Facehugger is a peculiar variant of the facehuggers that was featured in Aliens vs. Predator, Deadliest of the Species comic series. These peculiar creatures were the result of Toy, a rogue AI used by a major mega corporation of the alien universe. Unlike the traditional facehuggers, the white hybrids had spikes on their backs, providing them with an additional layer of protection. Interestingly, these facehuggers displayed a somewhat docile behavior in the few instances they were observed. They were mostly presented from a hand and exhibited non-aggressive tendencies. Such behavior set them apart from other facehugger types known in the Alien franchise. Upon successfully implanting their embryos, the resulting xenomorphs showed a unique blend of human, predator, and xenomorph traits, making them a truly exotic xenomorph breed. Some of these hybrids even displayed the ability to speak and use human weapons, setting them further apart from their traditional xenomorph counterparts. However, the white hybrids met their ultimate demise at the hands of Ash Parnell and her predator ally called Big Mama. As a special mention, I would also like to introduce you to the giant facehugger that was shipped with the Alien Space Marines limited comic titled Aliens Terradome. These bad boys were much larger in size, probably a larger than a royal facehugger. Interestingly, their only job was to guard the ovomorphs and could not really impregnate a host. Appearance-wise, they looked pretty similar to the giant scorpions. So, that was all from our end. If you know about any other facehugger variants, feel free to let me know in the comments below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone!